Superman 3 had been a disappointment to pretty much everybody. It had not been the box office success of the first two films, and it was certainly not a critical success. And it, it, it nearly killed the series. The series was dormant for four years, uh, which was its longest dormant period to date. And then it was revived in 1987 in the form of Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. And this movie is, by popular consensus, considered to be the worst of the Superman films. I still think it's a, just maybe a hair better than Superman 3. At least it's not a failed comedy. It's, it's, uh, it's under-budgeted. It's very, very poorly made. It's the most shoddy, definitely, of all of the Superman films. Um, but it gets just enough stuff right that I would give it the edge over Superman 3. Superman 4 is the result of the the stock of Superman dropping to such a low point that even the Salkines, who were responsible in many ways for the Superman brand rising to its highest height in the late 70s and early 80s, they just were done making Superman feature films. They had been the, the team that had convinced Hollywood and, and the world that Superman was an A-list property. And now they were the ones responsible for seeing it drop back down to that B-list level. This was how far Superman had fallen in less than 10 years from the glorious A-list centerpiece film of Richard Donner's Superman the Movie down to the third sequel produced under the lowly auspices of Golan Globus. The only hint of inspiration, of passion, in Superman for The Quest for Peace comes from its star, comes from Christopher Reeve, who tries his best to carry this movie on his back. He plays the lead role. He is uh, credited with co-writing the story. Uh, he does everything he can to try and return the series to its former glory. We saw with Superman 3, with the handing over of the reins fully to Richard Lester, how it had transitioned from the earnestness and the light comedic touch of Richard Donner to the hoary slapstick and more cynical view of humanity of Richard Lester and how ruinous that had been, how that had just totally fucked the character and fucked the movies. Uh, Superman 4 tries to get away from that, tries to return to this more uh, earnest, more heartfelt, more straight-on take of the character, and tries to also involve him in a socially relevant story. Superman 4 finds Superman involved very strongly in the issue of nuclear disarmament, which was a huge hot-button topic in the late 80s when the Cold War was still very much in people's minds and the issue of uh, mutual annihilation of the Soviets and the Americans uh, was still being talked about. And uh, Superman decides that he is going to take it upon himself to disarm the nuclear arsenals of the world. It's a decision that uh, he has made, he has decided he can no longer stand by and, and just sort of wait for nuclear war to break out he's going to do something to prevent it. He's going to take the law into his own hands and take it upon himself to disarm the world's nuclear bombs. And he gathers them all up into a giant net and he throws them into the sun. Everybody seems pretty cool with it. The only people that have a problem with it are the illegal arms dealers, the armies of the world from whom he is taking these weapons seem to be totally cool with it. They're like, oh, thank you. Thank you, somebody finally getting rid of these nukes. You know, there's not really any pushback from the, the governments of the world. Uh, but the illegal arms dealers are not liking this at all. And uh, they bring their complaints to Lex Luthor, who uh, affects yet another escape from prison, like we saw in Superman 2. Uh, this time not with the help of Otis and Miss Tessmacher, but with the help of his good-for-nothing nephew Lenny, played by John Cryer. Uh, and he decides to use these... these uh, the disgruntled arms dealers to help him get his revenge against Superman. Because Lex has yet another crazy scheme, and this scheme does not involve uh, real estate, it involves 
genetically cooking a clone of Superman that will be his slave and that will take Superman out, that will be a, a, a physical equal of Superman, powered by the sun, nuclear man. And he uses his connections with these arms dealers to get his, his genetic material attached to the side of a missile that Superman will then catch and fling into the sun and, and thus nuclear man is born. And this uh, story for Lex is very reminiscent of Lex's story in Superman 2, uh, where he did not create the Kryptonian supervillains, but he tried to manipulate them. And this is very much what he does in Superman 4. He creates this new uh, super-powered adversary for Superman and then attempts to manipulate him into doing his bidding. There is a lot of pining for the good old days in Superman 4. And it's sad because this is obviously a much lower budgeted film, a much less prestigious film than, than even Superman 3, and certainly less prestigious than Superman the movie or Superman 2. And yet it, 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 it struggles repeatedly to recreate uh, the magic of those earlier films. There's a very strong sense of nostalgia in Superman 4. It's as if Sidney Fury, the director of Superman 4, watched Superman and Superman 2 and latched on to certain pieces and thought, damn, I wish I had directed that. Oh, wait, fuck it, I will direct it. Because there are scenes in Superman 4 that are carbon copies of scenes from Superman and Superman 2. There's uh, a, a, a recreation of Superman's flying scene with Lois. There's a recreation of Lois discovering Superman's identity and then of Superman kissing Lois and mind raping her again <laughs> and wiping her memory of his true identity for a second time. Uh, nice to see that he doesn't feel any lingering guilt whatsoever for doing that to Lois in Superman 2. Uh, there's also another instance of Superman losing his powers and having to turn to that uh, incredibly useful green crystal to, uh, to gain them back, although this technically is a different green crystal. This is a green crystal that he uh, discovers in the, the, the crashed remains of his Kryptonian spaceship back at the farm that for some reason he just didn't find the first time. Uh, which, and that scene itself is, is a recreation of the scene in Superman the movie when Clark finds the first green crystal. There's just so much of this movie that is a, a, a carbon copy of something in an earlier Superman film. It's, it's really kind of striking. And it's, it's almost as if Sidney Fury and the producers of this version are saying, Hey, 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 remember how much you really liked Superman and Superman 2? Remember that? Wasn't that great? Well, here it is again. Huh? Huh? Come on! And it's really too bad because the political elements of this movie, the, the notion of Superman taking on a real-world problem is, is intriguing, and that's something that, that traditional thinking tells you to avoid when you're writing a Superman story. They, they tell you, uh, well, you know, you can't have him deal with any real-world problems because then the readers would notice that the problem still exists in the real world, and, you know, they, it, would, it would cause them to lose their suspension of disbelief with the character. They would lose their connection with Superman. But the way it's dealt with in Superman 4 could have worked, because what we see is Superman tackling the problem head-on and throwing the nuclear missiles into the sun, but, but eventually realizing that the, the weapons themselves are not ultimately the problem that the problem is, is at, at root, fundamentally, something that even Superman is not big enough to solve. Uh, and that it's not really Superman's place to try and solve the problem, because it, it doesn't just pertain to the weapons people have. It's about people's attitudes, and it's about the, the, uh, the conflicts that people have toward each other, and, and it's just manifested in the weapons. And so it's about Superman realizing his limitations. And that could be a great story. That's, that's the ingredient of a really great Superman story. And it just, it just doesn't happen in Superman 4. It, just, it, 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 it becomes more about Superman versus nuclear man and, ha and them having various fights in space and on the moon and in Metropolis. And the movie just becomes distracted by that and it loses sight of this essential uh, 
core of the story, that it's about Superman tackling this unsolvable issue and realizing that even he can't solve it. There's other stuff going on story-wise in this. Uh, there's a subplot about the takeover of the Daily Planet. Uh, someone comes in and buys the newspaper, Mr. Warfield, and he wants to turn it from a newspaper into sort of a trashy tabloid. And there's his daughter, Lacey, played by Mariel Hemingway, who sort of swoops in and takes over as editor and is like a rival for Clark's affections uh, with Lois and and Superman as well and uh, there's there there's this weird sense of Lois of Margot Kidder's Lois having morphed into the 1950s version of the character like she's no longer the uh, the city beat firecracker cynical smart uh, Lois that we saw in Superman the movie now suddenly she's like the pure hearted alternative to the cynical young uh, progressive Lacey Warfield who just cares about money and selling papers and, and getting lurid headlines and, and sleeping with Clark, seducing Clark. Like She's sort of like the, the evil temptation and Lois, by contrast, is like the pure-hearted girl next door. Which is strange when you consider how she was portrayed in Superman the movie, which was anything but that. There's some attempt at romantic comedy. There's uh, a, a whole series of, of mishaps where Clark and Superman are supposed to be on a double date with Lois and Lacey at the same time. And uh, it's, it's almost like a slamming door farce. Or it attempts to be a slamming door farce where Clark has to constantly come up with reasons to leave the room so he can change into Superman and come back because he's supposed to be there as Superman for Lois and as Clark for Lacey. And one of the jokes is that Lacey prefers Clark to Superman. Uh, she's way more interested in Clark. She doesn't really get Superman. And whereas Lois, it's sort of the opposite. She's, you know, never really had a great serious interest in Clark, but she's all about Superman. And uh, again, that doesn't really work. It's just not very well executed. Uh, it's not as snappy and as quick as it needs to be. Overall, just a really underwhelming movie. It, it is at least a bit more ambitious for the character than Superman 3. It attempts to return to the more earnest, uh, admiring take on Superman uh, that we got from the Richard Donner film, but it just, it just can't do it. It's, it's, it's not very well written at all. It's very, very poorly directed, very poorly made. Just, just, it's just a bad movie. It's, it's the nadir of the Superman film series in terms of its budget and in terms of its presentation. It's exactly the sort of movie that Superman the movie was made to uh, liberate Superman from. Um, now we see Superman back down at the bottom and sort of dredging around in, in, in the B-movie morass that he was supposed to have been elevated above by Superman the movie. Now here he is at the bottom. This is the movie that ultimately killed the Superman series. It, it was dormant after this for much longer than the four-year period between Superman 3 and Superman 4. This, it looked like it was going to be the last Superman movie. And sadly, it was the last Superman movie for Christopher Reeve. Uh, this was made in 1987. I think seven years after this was when he had his horse riding accident and was paralyzed for the remainder of his life. And so, so even though it's a bad movie, and even though there's very little in it to recommend it, uh, watching Superman 4 does have a bittersweet effect on me because it is the last time that you see Superman portrayed by Christopher Reeve. It is the last time that, that that iconic character is played by the actor who gave the definitive performance in that role. And it's and in light of that, it's it's an even more of a shame that Superman 4 is not a better movie.